Before we start this podcast, this episode is sponsored by Zeta Markets. So if you want to trade perps without giving your coins to centralized exchanges, Zeta gives you all the benefits of your favorite exchange with self custody and transparency. Trade perps with leverage, uh, backed by Solana speed, scalability, and almost no gas fees. The link is in the description. Let's get back to the video. I think yeah, we're on the cusp of a very exciting change. I think AI will continue to change a lot of industries and will disrupt. A lot of industries. Hi Jay, hi Sukans. Uh, how's it going? And welcome to the show. It's going well. Thanks for having us. Yeah, pretty good. I'm excited. Um, I'll put the greats on the Gad show. So, getting to the first question, what has been both of your like uh, origin story? Yeah, so my name's Sukan from New Zealand. Always kind of been a, a builder, and now now I found myself in the crypto space. I think this like. Journey may have started like back when I was nine years old, uh, when I first started coding. I think I was trying to make cheats for video games since I was just getting destroyed. I failed, but I did get into coding, which was good. Continued building throughout middle school, basically trying to make pocket money for myself. So making websites for people, making like scripts for RuneScape, Minecraft mods. Um, and in high school, got a bit deeper into building products. So actually had like products with five digit profits, which was a lot for a 14 year old at the time, um, I felt like a millionaire and continued on that path throughout uni, got into startup competitions, did pretty well and realized, Hey, look, this is what I want to do. Spent a bit of time at big tech at Microsoft for uh, a summer or so. It was a lot of fun, but it also made me realize like big tech is definitely not the right fit for me. And because of that, I decided to basically uh, go uh, like go all in on startups and built an edtech startup after uni and uh, which is actually still running and then soon after that decided to pivot into crypto in the classic 2020 2021 bull run yeah uh, and here I am now at Waymon. Awesome. It's a hard story to follow, but I'll do my best. Essentially, started started programming pretty early on, similar to Sukons. Found myself making Minecraft mods, doing all of that stuff. Seventh grade started freelancing for like fifty dollars a month or like five cents an hour. Um, got got some good experience doing that. Found myself into a into a position working for Sean Parker, the ex president of Facebook, basically doing iOS app development for him. And it was during that time, which was in ninth grade, if I'm not mistaken, that somebody told me, "Jay, put all of your money in crypto." And I was like. <laughs> No, that doesn't seem very smart. It sounds like a scam. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, I read about crypto and I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. I read a post by Ethereum's Vitalik Buterin. I'm like, oh, this is, I don't understand 90% of this, but the 10% that I do understand, it's pretty awesome. Um, and I was instantly super excited about crypto. So I started to dive deep into the rabbit hole and as most do, just completely aped into Ethereum. And lucky for timing, it went up a bunch. Thought I cracked the stock market continue aping into Ethereum until my bank account zero and it's all in Coinbase. And it's during that time that I actually start to learn what's going on. Then the 2017 bull run comes around, build a mobile wallet that makes it easy to buy and sell shit coins that aren't on um, Coinbase because at the time Coinbase only had three assets. So then built this mobile wallet, ended up being acquired by my crypto in 2019, 2018, 2019. Stuck around there doing DeFi strategy stuff for a while, then left to go and start Rari Capital, which was a DeFi lending and borrowing protocol. Grew it to about a billion and a half dollars under management and then merged with the Tribe DAO or the DAO merged with the Tribe DAO, at which point I stepped back and had the opportunity to think about what what is immensely valuable in the blockchain space and found myself teaming up with Sukons and a few others to start Waymont. Awesome. Uh, what has been both of your student lives? I think mine has, uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, mostly consisted of building. So not, not exactly a traditional student life. I did actually graduate university, though. So I guess that's like a, I don't know, potentially a stain on my record in crypto. I feel like, you know, all the best people have dropped out. But, you know, I'll, I'll take the, deg- the engineering degree. But yeah, uh, a lot of my like, pretty much my entire final year was like building that ed tech startup and then it kind of continued on to that into like a crypto startup as well and then of course waymon as well yeah for me a little bit different obviously was building throughout most of my education um and then found myself in college at this crossroads where it was like 
okay, do I double down on crypto or do I continue to split my attention between education and crypto? And realistically just did a lot of thinking and didn't see the the ev or the value in continuing to pursue a college education so said hey i'm gonna put this on hold as most do haven't touched it since so we'll, we'll see what happens there maybe maybe i'll go back once once like once the next bull run is over but unlikely uh you're both been business boys like both of your startups have been acquired previously how does it feel? Yeah. So I, I actually didn't mention this in the origin story, but after kind of pivoting from the EdTech startup into crypto, uh, me and the same EdTech team, we built a growth tool in the NFT community. Basically, um, it was called NFT Earn. I think the website is still live, but uh, it was effectively like a social leaderboard that incentivized people to uh, promote and grow their NFT projects that they were holders for. And we worked on that for like four months and then we started getting an acquisition offer and we got an acquisition offer from a pretty large NFT agency. Funnily enough, it's the NFT agency that like handled the IP for like, I don't know, ACDC and Cheech and Chong, um, the stoner duo, which is kind of a funny group to sell a company to. But for, for me, it wasn't really like a, a life changing exit, let's say, right, in terms of finance, but it, it was definitely a very interesting experience in terms of like negotiating that sale and going through that process of how do you actually sell a company both from the legal side the operational side and like handling all the issues with all the stakeholders involved so overall i think it's like rewarding and fulfilling to know that you've built something that someone else actually wanted and gains value out of and really good learning experience i think for me similarly it's it's very special when you build something that delivers value to people Right. And that's that's just a feeling that you can never give up. And when you go through an acquisition process or even a merge process, you're giving up a little bit of that. Right. That special feeling that you've acquired. Right. Because you're bringing in an external partner. You're bringing in external shareholders. You don't know what they're going to do. Right. So it is a little bit of a sacrifice. But for each of these things, you have to think, what is what 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 picture is this painting? And it's At the end of the day, each of these acquisitions, each of these merges, at least on my end, have been to paint a larger picture, right? I've realized that the mobile app of Ambo that was sold to my crypto, the Rari Capital DAO that merged with TribeDAO, these were each pieces of a much larger puzzle. And the acquisition, yes, while sacrificing something and sacrificing that feeling, that control, whatever you want to call it, it helped create something much more special than it would have been in isolation. So I think overall, it's it's mixed emotions, right? It's like your baby's growing up, your baby's going to college, but it's an exciting time and it's also a kind of a sad time, right? Maybe not sad, but emotional time. What is the best and the worst decision you both are taking? Man, I feel like the best decision that I'm just like very happy is learning to code and getting into tech. Like a lot of the good things in my life and a lot of the like, I don't know, I feel like I'm in a very happy and good place in my life. And a lot of it comes down to like freedom, my ability to like, go anywhere, do anything I want to do. And I don't think that would have been possible without technology, right? And that's like opened up a lot of opportunities for me. Worst decision? I don't know, dude. I've made so many bad. I like longed Tron in 2017, dude. Like I've done some stupid things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we might be here forever if I start listing those. But yeah, <laughs> I, I don't have one on hand. I'll, I'll let you take it next, Jay. Yeah, is, is, it, is it bad that we both thought of trading examples for the worst decision <laughs> in our life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mistakes. I, I was going to uh, say I needed some short-term liquidity and accidentally ended up selling the Ohm bottom the, the exact day that Olympus hit the bottom, which really sucked. But in terms of best decision, like this, this sounds very, very corny and cheesy, but I feel like just like continuing to live life, like I feel like it's a pretty good decision overall. Like I feel like life is pretty awesome. I feel like you can make it awesome, obviously through consecutive good decisions, but I feel like just like continuing to show up every day get to see sukons every day during our daily things like pretty great life Ooh, uh, if you had had a time machine what will you all do yeah i don't really think about like you know what, what would i change too much I, I guess like aside from financial stuff right i think i'm in a pretty happy place now and i'm pretty optimistic that i'm going to be more happy and more successful in the future um so i don't know i could go back in time like optimize my life achieve more Maybe I would be like kinder, spend more time with family, but it's like, 
overall, if you're going to end up in a good, successful, happy place, then why change things? Largely agree. I think one interesting thing that like really affected my thinking here was I think it was Jeff Bezos that's written about this in this thing called the regret minimization framework. Basically a way to think about how you live your life and how to basically obviously minimize the regrets that you lead in your life. Um, so I'd say like, as much as I'd want to like say there are these minor events in history that I would love to change. Obviously you have the the other factor to consider here, which is like the butterfly effect of things, right? And, and essentially when you go back and make these decisions, what, you, what you're basically asking is like, okay, do you want another, like, do you want another, do you want to like do another dice roll on life? Right. And like, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of like factors like day to day that I'm just like, oh yeah, this could be better. This could be better. This could be better. But would I want to take that dice roll on life? You, even if it's to go in a time machine and change one thing, that's, that's un, unlikely. Right. Um, that, that's at least how I would think through this. Um, I, I don't think that I would step in that time machine. And if I were to, just be to go back to right where I am. Or maybe to the future, if that's possible, because that would be sick. Uh, what does it feel to be a founder? Yeah, I think being founder and maybe maybe we can like perhaps talk a bit more about like the CEO position since we've both experienced it, Jay, which is like, I think it's definitely one where you have like a surreal amount of stress on you in terms of like, you are responsible for every decision, right? Everything that goes good and bad effectively at the end of the day it's on you right like obviously the performance of team matters but at the end of the day the success of your company comes down to you and it, it can be quite stressful if the only thing in your life is your company right and often i think especially like early stage founders for their first companies will make their lives entirely about their company so i would say it's quite a difficult job in terms of like managing your own mental state and making sure that you have other things going good in your life, right? Just so when your metrics are down and your like company stops growing, um, specifically like, I don't know, with the EdTech company, like when it's summer holidays, right? Like metrics just drop like 90%. Um, or in crypto, like when the NFT bear market started, like uh, it was pretty clear, like it was time to get out for us. I think you just have to have like, maintain your exercise routines, maintain sleep, like, um, have friends in life that aren't in crypto or aren't related to your startup, right? So you have other things going well. And I think that's pretty important. So I, I guess I only talked about like the downsides. There's definitely a lot of positives as well in that like you really wake up every day being excited and you know what you're working on is something you really care about, right? It's not like a nine to five that you're just getting through. You're actually excited to go to work and work hard. Um, and I think it like it's the same for like founding teams, right? Um, it's like, you know, you're working on something important that you care about. Yeah, that's that's my take. What about you, Jay? Yeah, yeah. I think you put it really well. I, I would probably summarize like the experience of being a founder or on a founding team in, in a few different ways. The, the first would be like emotional volatility. Largely speaking, your your emotions when, when you're running a startup are tied to that of the startup, right? When the startup has good days, you have amazing days, right? When the startup has shitty days, you have really crappy days. Um, and that's something that you can't escape, right? And it's probably something that makes the startup better, right? Because you are so personally invested in it. And I think that this applies for everybody on on the founding team and basically everybody who just feels invested in the project. And I think that is actually a really amazing thing. Other other ways that I would that I would explain this, and in the past this hasn't been true, but I would say it's very, very true of the Lamont experience that I've had, is feeling like we're like we're like seal team six almost right it's just like we're a team working in cohesion with each other we have a crazy crazy challenge ahead of us right most will say that it's impossible but that's why that's why we're still seal team six right like largely speaking the experience of a founder is proving to everybody that everybody else is wrong and that you're right Right. And that's that's a very hard thing to do because you're literally battling everybody else in the world because otherwise they'd have gone and made the startup that you're making right now. Right. So it's a very, very amazing thing when you're able to cross that chasm. But until then, it's purely an uphill battle and a good one. It's one that you should enjoy and one that I definitely enjoy every day. Got it. Uh, what has it been to build Rari Capital? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So Rari Capital started as a side project. And by side project, I mean, I was still in high school. So for, for historical context here, 
it was senior year and COVID started. And we were told we can't leave the house. And I didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> right? I was like, crap. I have so many new hours in the day that I'm just sitting at home doing nothing right now. And at the time, can't say I was doing nothing. I was working two different jobs. One was as the VP of growth at a startup called Dormzy, which was doing like um, tasks for college students. And the second was I was leading strategy at my crypto. Um, I did both these tasks because uh, I was just bored. And obviously, my crypto, I had a vested interest in succeeding. At the start of at the start of quarantine, I realized like, wow, I can continue doing this stuff. Or I can once again be a founder and go and do my own thing and go and do my own vision. And I had a lot of very interesting thoughts about DeFi, right? Um, we were in the, the entire team of, of my crypto was lucky enough to be around before DeFi was called DeFi and back when it was called Open Finance. And I had a decent chunk of change from the my crypto acquisition. Now I wanted to go and deploy it. I wanted to go and deploy it in DeFi because I thought the yields in DeFi were awesome back then. So basically end up leaving my crypto, leaving Dormzy and saying, I'm going to go and try and build the best way to go and earn yield on this capital. I call up my friend, Jack Lipstone, who helped me start um, there, who helped the, the other startup I was previously working on that was acquired and then called up a friend named David Lucid, who we interviewed and wanted to hire at my crypto, um, but didn't end up doing. Um, and I said, you guys, I have this, I have this idea of, a, it wasn't even called the yield aggregator. I forgot. We, we called it a fund. We said, we want to go and start a fund. Um, and we just want to go and earn yield in DeFi. That's exactly what we did. David did no smart contracts. He built this off-chain bot that would just move money from, from destination to destination. DYDX to Compound, Compound to Aave, whatever was even around back then. And then DeFi Summer starts to come around and Yearn comes online and Yearn attracts millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in a liquidity mining program. And they do it all via smart contracts. We're like, those smart contracts, that's what they're used for. That's pretty cool. And we said, we want to go and do smart contracts. Then we go and build Rari using smart contracts. Um, initially, the, the thing was actually called Farmer's Fund, and then we renamed it to Rari. And we go and launch the first version of Rari that used smart contracts at a $350 deposit limit. And again, because we had so much time and we knew so many people with so much time, we hired a bunch of kids in our high school to start DMing people on Twitter and saying, hey, you should deposit into Rari Capital. And when they said there's a $350 deposit limit, there were people that made so many different accounts just to deposit into Rari. We grew it up to $50,000 under management. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And then, and we continue growing it. And then, and then we realized, oh, we could launch a token. That would be pretty cool. Um, and we go and do that. And that $50,000 under management turns into $95 million under management. And all of this dopamine is hitting us. And we're like, holy shit, there's this crazy yield aggregator that we just built. This is awesome. This like We just built the future. And then the liquidity mining stops. And the TVL shrinks down to $3 million, which, yes, was greater than the $50,000 we started with. But it was nothing compared to the $95 million that we had at, at its peak. And we said, shit, what do we do now? We own a small percentage of this token, very, very small percentage. Again, we were a fair launch project and we had a few million dollars in TVL, which was earning like maybe $10,000 in fees per year for the DAO itself. Um, and we had on we had we had governance, right? So we didn't even control the project fully. So we said, "What what should we do?" And there were a lot of different ideas thrown around during this time. And it was a, it was a time of a couple of months of just like exploration. And one of the things that we were pushing for the entire time of Rari was enabling for our pool tokens, right? Your deposits into the into the smart contracts to be borrowed against at Compound and Aave and all these venues. And at the same time, we understood that there was a need to want to borrow arbitrary ERC twenties. At the time, also, SushiSwap was working on something called Bento, and nobody really understood Bento. They didn't have any documentation on this random thing called Bento. Um, but I later learned that this was kind of similar to what Rari Capital would then pivot to, and that was called Fuse. And Fuse started because one Christmas night of, of that year, I called David, my, my CTO, and I'm like, David, David, I have this random idea. Tell me if it's stupid or if this is cool. Um, and I said, imagine Compound and Aave but with segmented pools like a balancer. And every user like balancer can go and customize their own pools. And David's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and we talk about it for an hour on Christmas night. And that's really what started the the, the spiral to, 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 to fuse. So then 10 days later, we're, we're still talking about it back and forth. David hasn't told me anything besides these conversations. And David screen shares on one of our meetings, team meetings, and he screen shares a demo of fuse. And I'm like, 
You just built mm-hmm. that. And I had no idea that he was even building it during this entire time. I thought that was the most amazing thing ever. It was a scrappy demo. It just forked compound. Users could choose their own assets, choose their own interest rate curves. But I was like, that's that's the future right there. Right? You could take any of these assets, right? If we're going to imagine the future where everything is tokenized, this is going to be the engine that makes everything borrowable, everything lendable. It was a necessary part of the crypto future. And then we start pushing for it, right? We start telling people about it. We start figuring out what it's going to look like, start designing it, go really hard on this to go and launch it. And we have a few down managed pools. And I don't think that people fully understood what Fuse was in in the early days. We had a, and then we had like a launch, a launch event where 400 some people came on and just watched us demo creating pools and watched all these sick demo videos. And we had the Framework Ventures guys, the Nascent guys, and the Spartan group come and talk at this event that we put on, which would demo Fuse's power. Then basically people start to understand it and it clicks for people, right? You can see that click across crypto Twitter. You can see that click when talking to people about Rari, about the Fuse product in specific. And that's when it started to blow up and then prices started to go up and then people started to understand it more and the prices started to go up. And then you had this amazing, amazing spiral that led for it to grow up to $1.5 billion under management. And it was during this time that I started to fear that our biggest LPs would fork us, that this was an existential risk to Rari, right? We can't be rent seeking. We can't be doing anything. There's not really value in going and creating a a hyperstructure of sorts intrinsically, unless you're going to take fees one day, which clearly we couldn't do if we didn't own the liquidity. So we said, we need to buddy up with the biggest LP and diffuse. And that was Faye. So we, we ended up doing a merger with Faye so that they could deploy tons of liquidity across all fuse pools. And it became a very, very amazing relationship. So long story short, it was a really fun couple of years. It started as a side project. I had no idea what it would become, but it, it blew me like it blew my wildest dreams. Awesome. Uh, so Kans, how, how was in your startup from zero to one? Yeah, um, I'm not sure I can follow the 1.5 billion in TVL. We don't quite have <laughs> growth metrics like that in Intic, but I, I can maybe go into the Intic B2C journey there. Yeah, my first startup was called Zorbi. Uh, which was effectively a hyper-efficient learning tool that used flashcards. So the user would uh, answer a flashcard, then Zorbi would ask them how difficult it was to answer, and then they would report, like, I couldn't answer it, it was okay, it was tricky, or it was easy, right? And we had this um, mathematical algorithm that we'd feed in all their data to, and it would predict exactly when they're going to forget that piece of content, right? That was very valuable because then you can effectively create these daily study sessions for the student that only shows them the content they don't know. For us, uh, effectively, like kind of birth of Zorbi came from my own struggle, right? Uh, like, I don't know, most students, their biggest problem is usually studying. They want to save time. They don't want to spend time on school. And that's what it was for me. So I started studying in this like hyper efficient way and realized there was a a bit of a gap in the market, right? Because I tried to get friends to adopt it. Some of them did. And they went from like, you know, failing papers to getting straight A pluses. So I knew it was like a replicable technique, right? Like multiple students could adopt it and it would help them. Um, But there were a lot of issues with the existing players out there that prevented students from adopting it. So I spent my final year doing a ton of research into why that was, came up with a thesis on how we could solve that, and then just went all in after that. It took quite a while to get really some traction. We ended up pivoting across a few different markets in the first few months before eventually we got this like, uh, I don't know, we posted this video of like our Chrome extension on Reddit, right? And it just shot to the top of the studying Reddit and had like 600 upvotes. And we're like, okay, this is real enthusiasm, right? Finally, like people, uh, like, I don't know, Y Combinator always says, make something people want, right? And it felt like we had found something finally. So we kind of zeroed in on that, stuck to students, stuck to where I'd experienced the problem myself. And we continued working on it for about uh, another like six months or uh, we, we worked on it for like a year after that, but about six months later in September of 2020, we finally did our proper launch. Uh, so we did another few Reddit launches, like Hacker News launches, 
And that's kind of when it went crazy as well. So we were like, I don't know, at, at that time, it was very exciting. We were growing like 20, 30% week over week. Active users were increasing. Um, study usage and like uh, actual retention was improving like crazy. So uh, I think we ended up hitting like 100,000 flashcards reviewed per week at the time. And we were getting like 40,000 created. So that was pretty exciting to go from like, you know, having 10 users on your product that we're just complaining all day to like now suddenly having a thousand like people that are just constantly badgering you for features overall at that point like at that point is when we started getting like investor offers as well we had term sheets in front of us right for a seed round i think really i had become pretty crypto pilled at that point though so i knew i wasn't going to go all in on the ed tech space i knew i wasn't going to raise vc there at least mainly because like three months before that i'd started using uniswap i'd actually used rari as well and i ha held rgt at one point too uh before i'd ever met jay so uh, i knew that like okay crypto is going to completely disrupt and change the financial industry that's where i want to go in the future so we ended up turning zorbi after that journey into what is effectively like a, a lifestyle business it's still used by students it helps like dozens of teachers and students around the world um but it very much like runs autonomously, right? And it's kind of this utility that students study with. And I'm, I'm very happy it's found its place in that way. And, and it continues to grow and help students. So that's very cool. I think the biggest things I really got out of it, like definitely learned how to be a founder, how to kind of lead a team and go through that process of actually having zero users that are like having like five users that hate your product to having a product that people love and use every single day and actually want to see grow into something, um, which I think is very valuable given like my, my personal area of interest is in like product management and like product design and uh, a bit on the engineering side as well. So seeing how that all comes together to build like the perfect B2C product. Cool. Jay, what were the legal issues uh, with child labor? <laughs> That's really funny. No legal issues. I would say, again, Rari was a fun side project for a bunch of high school kids, right? That's how it started. And I think that the one thing that I always think about is the mimetic value of this child labor meme became extremely valuable to Rari's success over time. Um, it started with Tetranode on, on the Kobe show saying that he'll always invest in child labor. We were like, what the hell? It just started to trend on Twitter. And we said, okay. We're child labor, I guess. But of course, we're, we're not child labor. Everybody who worked at Rari was very excited to be working on Rari and working on some of the most revolutionary technology. I remember there was a big like Zoomer finance meme going around about Rari. <laughs> that was like Zoomer yeah. Fi, DeFi 2.0, which I think like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ohm was like badgered in there as well. Uh, what was the birth story of Waymont? Essentially, with Waymont, we were, we were initially spending a lot of time just thinking about crypto, right? We had a, we had a really special team thinking about crypto those problems right initially we set out to say okay there's a few major use cases of crypto right you have stores of value you have stable coins amongst a few others exchanges speculation whatever um but we think that there's more going on and we think that there's an opportunity to go and build a lot more so we put together a group of really the smartest people that we could find to try and go and figure out what these other opportunities are, right? And we created a bunch of really awesome technology during that time. Um, uh, some of it's some of it's been written about, and I, I hope that much more of it sees the light of day one day. But essentially, after after going through this exercise and building a lot of really, really what I'd say innovative and revolutionary tech, it became clear that foundation elements were missing to crypto, right? That distinct building blocks of crypto. We're missing and one of them and probably the most important one was custody right it's supposed to be something so simple right and it's something so core and fundamental to crypto right self-custody decentralization all of this stuff is so core to crypto yet the software that we use to custody our assets largely sucks the interfaces are amazing right zapper zerion backpack these are all amazing pieces of software but the ways that we custody our private keys, it sucks and it's outdated, right? People don't want to write down seed phrases. People don't want to have to like shard private keys across multiple different continents. We don't, people don't want to like have to do any of this, put the like, recovery phrase in a bank vault. They shouldn't have to do any of this, right? And a lot of these problems have actually been solved in like web two. And, and we needed to rethink how crypto thinks about custody. 
And that's exactly how Waymont started is trying to build a better custody solution because we want to go and build all of this amazing stuff, but we can't do that without this basic building block solved. So over a longer term, we have a lot of very, very fun, exciting, and revolutionary stuff to go and build with Waymont. But right now we're starting by going and doing something really, really simple, which is building a better custody software. And that wasn't even simple enough. So we said, we're going to make it even simpler. We said, we're going to build better custody software built for high net worth individuals, right? The small segment of a, like a broad category. We said, we're just going to solve it for these people. Then we're going to go and build it for everybody else. Maybe, maybe, but broadly speaking, we wanted to just go and solve this so that it will unlock a lot more down the road. Sukhan, what did I miss? <laughs> no, I think that's, that's pretty well put. Um, and it like describes how we landed at it. I remember like when we were going through that kind of like few month brainstorming and exploration phase, like. In me, I think like even on day one, we were like, okay, everyone, we all hate custody. We all hate storing crypto. It's like the worst thing. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get robbed like every single day. And I think it really like took us a couple of months to realize like, okay, the, the biggest problem in crypto is kind of sitting in front of our noses and let's, let's take a unique approach and let's fix it. Right. We had the network to tap into. We knew people, other people, we knew like several dozen people in our immediate network that had this problem and they would pay a lot of money to solve it as well. So it was like, okay, this is, this isn't like make something that people want, right? It's like make something that people need. Like they desperately needed this solution. Tell me, Raymond. Let, let me ask you this question is how, how do you store your private keys right now? Good question. Uh, okay. Well, without telling me the answer to this, just think about it, right? Where you yes. secure your private keys, right? Yeah. If you if you have it in your head, that feeling in your stomach that you feel when thinking about it, I bet that's not an amazing feeling. Yeah. And that feeling that you feel right before you press that send transaction every time, right? That feeling as you go and read that transaction data like four different times, trying to make sure everything is perfect, right? That time that you copy and paste an address and you check that you, to make sure that your computer hasn't been compromised and another address has been pasted. All of these feelings are freaking scary. And if you want to get rid of them, you're going to use Waymont. And so is everybody else. That's a great pitch. Uh, what has been one of the funniest incidents in your life? I don't know the funniest incident in my life. When we were teaching you how to drive a golf cart and you managed to crash it into a bush on a straight road. <laughs> Like literally <laughs> completely 90 degree or like 180 degree. Oh no, it was, it was a car road. Not where Sorry, you crashed, it was, it was that was crack. definitely straight. I'm pretty sure it was a straight oh. road. <laughs> <laughs> That's the straightest road I've ever seen, dude. And there was no turn for another like 50, 100 meters and you managed to crash it into a bush. And crash it deep, man. I didn't like, I don't know how that was possible, but like, yeah, that's... When I think back, like that's definitely one of the funniest moments of my life. I, I think for me, I don't, I don't know why this memory came to mind. It, I, obviously, I don't think anything's going to beat the golf cart story. Um, but a, a, a second place and a, a far second place would be um, once. So one, one of my roommates in college, he, his entire life, he all he had eaten was chickens, beans, and rice, and maybe one other food. So when he came to college, he was exposed to lots of new foods and he found them very, very interesting and he loved them, but he'd make the strangest combinations of food. So one day I came out from like six hours of meetings back to back. It must have been like late at night doing just calls with different time zones. And I saw him eating in the kitchen and he had a bunch of food out on the on the table as always. And in his hand, he had a cookie, right? Just a chocolate chip cookie, which he made in the oven, clearly. And it had guacamole, and then cheese, and then a piece of sushi, and then another cookie. <laughs> and he was just eating it. And that has to be like, after six hours, I was like dead. Six hours straight calls, I was dead. And I see this guy just eating his sushi cookie with guac. I couldn't stop laughing. Really challenging his <laughs> taste buds there. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. In my defense, there was a block... 20 meters ahead of me and I was turning right 
I don't know about that. That's about that. Maybe we can maybe we can post some photos on the like tweet thread. Oh no, no, we are not doing that. <laughs> we can have Twitter decide no. if that road was straight. <laughs> that, that obstacle was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have a hidden talent? I can speak and write basic Mandarin. I exclusively use like Chinese delivery apps when I'm in New Zealand. So maybe that's like something unique that like people or people always get confused by when they like see me ordering food they're like why is this app in chinese and i'm just like you know it's like free delivery so like of course i'm the user over uber eats sorry uh, how is how is chinese delivery apps free i i don't know it's crazy dude they somehow have like free delivery and they also like uber eats always adds like a 30 percent surcharge right to every meal like the chinese apps don't do that so it's like you're pretty much just like ordering takeaway and then it arrives like pretty, I, I think it takes like slightly longer since sometimes they do multiple deliveries, right? To make it cheaper. But I don't know. It, it's like always been pretty fast for me. So yeah, it always like annoys my friends. But it's like sometimes they'll mess up their order when, they, when we're sharing an order. In exchange for data. Yeah, in exchange for data. That's no. like selling my like food preferences <laughs> to the CCP. <laughs> they can have it, man. I, I love Chinese food. Yeah. Awesome. For me, I feel like it's I I can burp on demand. I'm not gonna do it, but I can. Come on, man! <laughs> you gotta prove it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just drop that. All right, you can do it privately later. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I have a hidden talent where I can move my ears. Let's see. Oh, so that's not sure. right, Do it again. Do it again. Oh. Okay. Do it again. Uh, Oh, that's crazy. What? Whoa, what? Yes. Yeah, I didn't even know that's like physically, biologically possible. They have ear muscles. All right. Sukons, yeah. have you ever tried? I'm trying right now. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I, like, I don't think it's sounding, dude. I, 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 don't, I think Gajesh is just like at the next stage of human evolution. Like, where we can ears. Um, I don't think I quite have that skill. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think about the future of Web3 and DeFi? I think we, this is like definitely a topic we talk about a lot at, at Waymon. There's some areas that I don't really want to comment on because we, we're not completely sure, right? And I'm, I'm not completely sure personally. My personal view of crypto and Web3 is that there are very clear and massive unlocks for the financial industry, right? In that like stable coins enable international settlement at a near instantaneous speed uh, at a very low cost, right? Which if you've tried to send money internationally at any point, you know how annoying it is, you know how expensive it is. And even now we're using systems that were built in the 1900s, right? I think that's very powerful. I think decentralized finance in general, like uh, Maybe if we go back to that old name of open finance, it opens up and democratizes a lot of opportunities that a lot of people in certain like wealth demographics and certain geographic regions just don't have access to, right? And you can kind of see proof and product market fit and evidence of that in some of these underdeveloped countries in like South America and in Africa where crypto adoption has been skyrocketing, right? Um, like I think I read that like, Binance P2P is like one of the primary forms of like monetary transfer in Argentina, which is just insane to me, right? Like, and I think a lot of that value add is not necessarily obvious when you're living in like, you know, upper middle class, middle class, like America or New Zealand. And yeah, I'm just very excited about the unlocks that it's going to provide there. Um, I am a fan of NFTs as well, but I feel like they're very much driven by speculation right now. So we've we've yet to see like true PMF there uh, in terms of value. Yeah, I think for me, like the way that I would split this up is into like short, medium and long term. I think short term, the things that are working will continue to work. And I don't think that we're going to see any great zero to one innovation short term. All right. Maybe maybe I'm going to be proven wrong and I hope I'm proven wrong. Um, but I think that like largely this idea of yeah, stable coin payments and in, inside of Binance, right? Like stuff like this, exchanges, stores of value, um, L1s, the things that are winning will continue to win. I think medium term, and maybe this is a hope more than it is a, a like a fact or a belief then that I think that we'll start to unlock some of what's really possible with crypto. 
again, I, I still believe and maybe I'm just wrong, but I still believe that there's a lot to be uncovered with crypto and a lot of new economic models, right? Specifically being able to incentivize long tail assets in a way that like is, is places like Helium or companies like Helium can uniquely do because of crypto cryptocurrencies. Um, so th- that's the first thing in the medium term is I'm excited for more economic experiments that will unlock a lot of new things for the world. Um, the second thing, medium term, is I see finance being rewritten with DeFi for the same reasons that Sukon said. Um, I think that it's 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 inevitable. It's superior. You don't need T plus two settlement. All there's like there's so many different things that we could talk about and dive deep into remittances, T plus two settlement, uh, how stocks just settle, like whatever. Finance is old, and and crypto is going to rewrite it. I think that it might be a little bit different than most crypto people expected to. It, their beliefs will be pushed on permissionless versus permissioned. Beliefs will be pushed on KYC versus not KYC. All of these fronts, but it'll be super interesting to see how that plays out on that piece. And then longer term, I think it'll be most interesting because I think that we could be living in a society that's powered by crypto, right? By new crypto economic experiments that govern and facilitate a lot of different pieces of our lives, whether it's clear to us via something like Helium, Solana, Mobile, or whatever, um, or on the other side of things, like where it's so embedded in finance that we don't even realize what's happening. Um, And one thing that I think a lot about is the hyper-financialization of the world that will come with crypto and how basically when you put everything on a blockchain, it's an, and if you take the perspective that it's inevitable, that everything will become tokenized, then you end up with a pretty large wealth gap. Um, and this is something that I've been personally spending a lot of time thinking about and writing about, because essentially what ends up happening is the, the wealthy people, the ones with crypto assets in the early stages are able to basically buy the 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 real world assets that get subsumed into the blockchain later, basically leading to an insane wealth gap, right? The, the, the people in the lower to middle class will borrow against their future time and the people in the upper class will lend them against their future time. And when they default, you literally have reinvented indentured slave, slavery. Like th- that's obviously a very dramatic example, but I, I'm, I, I do fear for certain aspects of hyper financialization, which is why I think it's really important for us to be cognizant in how we innovate and the ways that we do it and i think that i think that web 3 could almost move slower on this front obviously what i'm discussing is decades away but it is still a fear of mine overall bullish on web 3 though <laughs> awesome that's really insightful both of you how does it feel to be uh the second generation indians in us and new zealand yeah i think it's definitely like a responsibility almost right i know that my parents came to New Zealand, they immigrated, um, went through a lot of struggle, basically like, I don't know, they were pretty well off in India, but that basically went to zero when they came to New Zealand, right? And I feel like I've seen like all stages of wealth throughout my life. Like the first few months we were in New Zealand, like we literally slept on a mattress, right? That's like, that's like, I mean, we weren't on the streets, but that's pretty like low class, right? Or like we weren't like well off. Um, we had to be pretty conscious, like I had to be careful. We were careful when we went to McDonald's, like I wasn't always allowed a cheeseburger, right? Because the money just wasn't there. Um, now, like uh, kind of across that period of like from the age of like two or three coming to New Zealand um, and not understanding that like, hey, look, we were poor back then. And then seeing my parents now like achieve pretty decent wealth just by like literally hustling, right? Like 16 hour days across this period of like 15, 18 years is pretty inspiring. And now I'm like, I don't know, being in tech and having been to big tech, it's like, I can pretty well say that I'm like, well off, right? And that, you know, I I earn a decent amount, I don't have to worry about money. And like being in crypto, I think a lot of people are pretty well off by now. Um, And I, I almost like feel a responsibility to like, now continue to work hard, take that one step further for my uh, entire family, but also like, the people around me and the people in the world, right? It's like, I don't want to say the word EA, but like, I, I feel like money can do a lot of good for the world, you know? And I feel like I have a lot of responsibility to just create value for the world so I can give back and really repay all the effort that, I don't know, my parents put in for me over those 18 or so years that they just hustled, right? And I mean, they're still hustling even now, even though they don't have to, 
which I think is just super inspiring to see as uh, like a you know second generation or I guess uh, yeah I'm technically like first generation but yeah a, as kind of a, a son of, of an immigrant family. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I picked up on from like a pretty young age in my family is that everybody's a hustler, and I think that this is like pretty resemblant of a lot of Indians, right? Is that they're willing to hustle, as Sukhan said, but they're also willing to persist, right? And they're willing to persist when times get tough and when there are challenges ahead. And I would say, like, this is probably one of the biggest learnings that I've had from my parents and grandparents is, like, yeah, there are times when time gets tough or when just, like, you have a shitty day or when shit just hits the fan, right? And, like, a lot of people will just default to giving up or turning the other direction, right? And I, I, I don't know if it's the, the Indian, but I do think it's the Indian inside of me that says, like, no, like, you can get through this. You can persist. Maybe it's because of what our families have been through over, over the past many, many centuries. But I, I, I do think that, largely speaking, the biggest outcome in learning from them is just the ability to persist and get through when times are tough. Gotcha. How do you all see yourself in the next five ten years i want to yeah i mean for me it's like be responsible uh or be part of creating something that's massively valuable for the world right something that creates immense value for the world and i think i, I don't know probably many founders and like startup people have this vision right it's just about like doing something that really matters and i i want to be part of that i want to be responsible for it and i want to bring something into the world that you know, does that. I think beyond that, it's like, uh, obviously I have like personal goals as well. Like, you know, I mean, I don't want to give up like the things that are important to me, like in terms of family, friends, you know, relationships. I think those are important to maintain. Otherwise you might go crazy uh, throughout the process, but yeah, just be in a good, happy place and have created value. Yeah. I think for me, one understanding that became clear after FTX fell is like, and like reading about EA and going deep into that is like, there's a lot of problems in our world, right? And there are very few people focused on some very important problems. Not not to be like an advocate for EA or anything, but what I would like to say in like five years or looking back is that I've been able to contribute to something positive, ideally on a large scale, just because there are so few people working on things that really, really matter. And I think if somebody can help, I think it'll have exponential effects for the rest of society. I like how like we're both a bit scared to like say anything about EA because of <laughs> like e- EA is inherently like intrinsically a good like movement, right? Like it's it's good. But... Yeah. What has been uh, one of your personal challenges which you have overcome, and how? I think for for me, a lot of those challenges probably come from like. Uh, I don't know, the startup world, right? I definitely think like building a startup was the hardest thing I did and just being able to like, I, I think, you know, we're, we're pre-launch at Waymon, but we've definitely overcome and gone through a lot of big challenges, like even like company threatening challenges at times, um, which have been like, as a team, we've gone through them. Um, in the past as well, like in the EdTech startup, like really just going from like points where, I thought the company was going to die, you know, we're in like a COVID lockdown, locked in a studio apartment, but then being able to like take something, uh, I guess like going back to like persistence, like Jay was saying, like being able to persist through that and then kind of almost like detach and be like, okay, everything's going to be okay. This is the situation I'm in. Like, this is what the chessboard looks like. What pieces do I need to move where? And how do I do that without like, you know, damaging my own mental health too much, right? Like disconnecting from the situation a little bit. And I, I think that's like definitely one of the things I'm most proud of, like being able to go from like zero to one uh, more than one time and like take things to profitability and like build something that's living and alive. Yeah, I, I think for me, one of the biggest challenges that I faced, like just looking at a five-year time scale, was that at Rari when stuff started to go well. Um, usually people think of that as how can, how can that be a challenge? But when you have a protocol that goes from a hundred million dollars to 10 X that to a billion dollars in, 
in a matter of what it what I, I don't even know the exact dates, but let's say a couple months, um, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, whether it be informing the community of how the protocol works and recommunicating that to the community, whether it be, oh shit, the servers that we're using to run our interface and the interface that we ran for the community, we need to bulk these up and we need to hire a new developer to add warning messages everywhere to explain what's going on here and to warn them about X, Y, and Z, right? There was a lot going on. And I would say like, probably one of the biggest challenges was navigating this, right? And navigating, how do you scale in, in a really high growth, hyper growth environment like this, when there's no playbooks on how to run a crypto startup? And I'd say like, the way that the way that we got through this was in, in a few different ways. First of all, our team was really like a family, um, which was pretty great, right? We just, we just worked well together. And we all went to high school together. So we had that natural relationship built in. The second thing that we did is we we leveraged those connections to go and expand our networks where we knew people um, were good because they were friends with somebody on the team. And we'd bring them into the fold to basically reinforce the troops, to reinforce the discord when people were asking questions at 2 a.m. And then the last piece, and I think the most important piece, was the lesson of over communication, right? Over communication with the team, over communication with the community over communication with anybody and everybody, right? It makes things so much easier, right? When people have to guess and when people have to assume things and when people are like, shit, what's going on? Like, why aren't they talking, right? It gets hard and people always assume the worst. But when you are able to over communicate, be like, look, I'm sorry, I'm not responding. (laughs) We're just experiencing really high growth right now. Maybe we put off a call or whatever, right? There's sacrifice. But most important was that sacrifice was met with over-communication, which made it acceptable and understanding to most people. So I, I think that these three things largely were able to help us combat some of the struggles we faced through Rari's times of extreme growth. Uh, what advice would you give to a student founder? Yeah, my advice here is like probably first, uh, I guess like if I could go back and talk to myself, like be very realistic about why you're doing what you're doing and what you want out of life. And then I think it's uh, maybe especially if you're not in like a startup hub, find people who have actually done what you want to do, right? And go and talk to them because in New Zealand and Australia, especially there's kind of a lack of mentorship. So I really had to like reach out of my circle and take initiative, right? Go and cold email, like Y Combinator founders in the past and like just hitting them up on LinkedIn and trying to get on calls. And I think usually like if you're a student, you have this like magical student card that lets you, it opens doors for you, right? Like you can um, like email the head of like, a company or like, I remember I would often cold email like the head managers for all of New Zealand for various companies or all of Oceania and they would get on call with me, right? And I'd just be like, hey, I'm working on this competition. I need your advice for this. Like, and they would give me product feedback and like really uh, what I was actually trying to do is like sell them a product, but I would like get on call and it was very powerful. Like I got a lot of mentorship out of that. If you take initiative, like opportunities get created, right? And when you're a student, you're in like the prime position to be able to do that. It's not as easy when you're like 28, although you can still continue to do and take initiative then as well. Yeah, also evaluate where you can create the most value for the world, right? And I think it's like, often that's where you wanna be working and that's where you should work on. And some of that comes down to like your past experience, what you're good at doing. Uh, and that that might change over time, right? Where it, it did change for me going from edtech to crypto. I felt like I could create more value here compared to other industries. And that's why I switched. So kind of be real to yourself about that. Uh, and maybe lastly, like just build and work crazy, crazy hard, right? It's going to be pretty different from your peers. Uh, you'll be working harder than them. You'll have less outings. Like you'll be able to hang out with friends less, but I don't know if you really want extraordinary results and you know this is what you want to do then you can't really operate like an ordinary person you have to work hard yeah for me i would echo everything sukhan said i think that was like amazing on that one point of initiative 100 percent agree with that i think the biggest problem 
with student founders that I've spoken to is they have an idea, right? And they're like, I've had this idea for three months. I've had this idea for six months. But I think the initiative is the most important part for getting that over, right? It shouldn't be, I've had this idea for three months. It should be, I've been working on this idea for three months, right? But so many people have these ideas in their head that they never let out into the world, right? And the world would be so much cooler of a place if everybody tried at least to go and conquer their ideas. The second thing that I would say, um, yeah, second and final thing I would say is the importance of thinking through things just critically, right? If you go and like write out your plan, right? That, that first step, right? If you were to just write out a few bullet points on your plan and then try and figure out another plan that makes sense and leads to the same outcome, you should be able to say why your plan is better than the other plan, right? You should be able to say why exactly you're doing each step on that plan. And these are very, like, this is a very simple exercise, right? This should be something very, very simple. Yet as founders, we're so motivated to just go, right? To just go and do, and we've struggled with this problem at Waymont many times in the past, right? But there's a lot of merit in just putting it down on a sheet of paper, figuring out the alternatives, and trying to tear it apart to make sure what you have on that piece of paper is going to be the best to whatever desired outcome it is. I think this applies to all aspects of life, not just being a founder. But I think it's especially important for being a founder because if you're able to do this one thing that nobody else is doing, that's an immense amount of alpha that you have for you as a founder, right? That's a competitive edge that you are building because it is shocking how many founders aren't thinking through their projects from first principles. Why does this make sense here? Why does this make sense here? What about this? Why did you choose this path? So many people can't answer simple questions here. And I think that if people took an extra week, even an extra month to go and figure out answers and figure out the optimal path to their outcome. Obviously, you're not going to get it right 100%. But if they do, that'll be very, very valuable. Got it. Jay, how was it building Ferrari out of your garage? I mean, it was pretty cool, right? It was, it was like just COVID. It was just a bunch of friends working together. Um, it definitely grew out of the garage, per se. Obviously, we we're still in COVID. But it it there was definitely a day when I was like, wow, this is not just a bunch of high schoolers messing around on their computers anymore. This is like legit software, legit finance. Like everything is suddenly now a business. It's not just a fun side project, but it definitely started as a fun side project. And those were honestly one of some of my favorite days was when we'd just be all hanging out on Zooms together during COVID, bored out of our minds. Yeah, we'd work really, really hard. But then we'd also just have a lot of fun just hanging out because we were, we were all pretty good friends. Cool. How did you convince the, convince the parents? So they parents. didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. They, were, they, they always knew I was just doing my crypto thing. They don't understand crypto whatsoever. But essentially, they didn't know what I was doing probably until we hit like $50,000 TVL. Um, and it was only at that point that I told them, oh yeah, 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 like this is, this is what I'm doing now. And they were like, oh cool. Why is this different than the last one? And I think when I explained it, they didn't understand it, but I tried my best. Awesome. I can feel that. <laughs> How do you balance work and personal life? Not very effectively in the past, but, um, trying to improve pretty heavily at that over the past, like six months or so. There's like baseline stuff that I really make sure I keep up like exercise, diet, sleep. And I think that's like. If you manage to get those three fundamentals down consistently, then like at least your mood and emotional volatility is under control, right? Um, and like try not to take too much caffeine, like limit that as well. Yeah, ma making sure you like have something outside crypto, right? Because it can be all consuming and just with the nature of the industry, like you end up spending a lot of time on Twitter, right? Where it's like all your thoughts shouldn't be like influenced by DJ and Spartan and like DCF gods tweets, right? <laughs> um, and like, I, I, ideally, you have some diversity of opinion from like friends that aren't related to technology uh, or are outside the tech industry. So, trying to maintain relationships there and just having a bit of life outside outside this world. Yeah, I think for me historically, I've also done a pretty shitty job of this in terms of working very 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 hard and then trying to be social failing at that and ending up screwing up my sleep schedule screwing up my diet screwing up whatever it is it's it's hard to succeed in all of these dimensions 
And I think that's something that people just need to understand is, yeah, you can't go and work out for two hours a day, cook all of your meals at home and work 14 hours and also get like 12 hours of sleep. Like this is just like mathematically impossible. And I think most people or I, I won't say most people, but I think a lot of people try to make it work. And I think that's where you lead to a deficit. So I think the biggest thing is coming to an understanding with yourself about where you're willing to make sacrifices and what you're willing to work on. Because realistically, being a founder, obviously, this is very different if you're not a founder, but being a founder, you need to make immense sacrifices. You can't be sleeping 12 hours a day while cooking food for every meal, taking up three hours and working out for another two hours, right? Like these, are, these numbers just don't add up, right? And a lot of people aren't willing to give it up. And I don't think that they're fit to be founders because if you want to go and build something valuable for the world and actually go and do something amazing, you're going to need to make these sacrifices as much as it sucks or it shouldn't suck. Yeah, that makes sense. I think we know a lot of people uh, who who only work and have no, uh, no work-life balance. I, what I will say on that note is like, I do think that if you were to zoom out and look at crypto like as an industry, I'd argue that the average person in crypto works for less than four hours a day, maybe even three hours a day. Um, and this is discounting the traders and all of the moon boys. I'm talking people who are working at companies and they spend the rest of the time just scrolling through Twitter, counting that as work and doing a bunch <laughs> of other things, right? So I think that it's really magical when you can find a group of people who understand what it means to actually work a long day, actually stay focused on that long day, take that sacrifice with you. Um, I, I just think that's super special if you can find that group. And I think that we've been able to do it at Waymon. Uh, what are your thoughts on AI? And have you ever had a thought where, hey, should I, should I leave crypto and go to AI? That's something more meaningful. I'm not going to give like too much profound thought leadership here. I think AI is obviously everyone's seen the advancements recently. Like it's very exciting. Chat GPT is changing the world. My mom, who is like completely technically illiterate, still uses Chat GPT every day, right? Because she finds it easier than Google. She's been like learning about nutrition, like some of the health issues that she's had. And she's been like, uh, yeah, looking up medication, things like that. And just like, asking random questions about like New Zealand law and like New Zealand accounting law and tax law, right? Which ChatGPT does a pretty good job at answering. So I think, yeah, we're on the cusp of a very exciting change. I think AI will continue to change a lot of industries and will disrupt a lot of industries. But I don't think AI really like, I don't know, AI having some advancements doesn't really change what crypto was going to do and like why uh why i believe like i got interested in crypto in the first place right those fundamental innovations that crypto will provide over the long term are still there and i'm still very excited to be a part of it and help create that right help become a architect for the future of this industry yeah i think for me it's like if you read about ai ai comes in waves right and ai has bull and bear markets very similar to crypto obviously theirs are much much longer my initial thought of ai was okay this is just another bubble of AI, um, and then started to understand chat GPT, understand what's going on. And there's a lot of really cool stuff that's having a profound impact on people's lives, like Sukhan's mom, right? It's like really awesome. That said, I think probably the two most important industries for the next couple decades will be AI and crypto. No matter the bull or bear markets, I think that these are the two biggest industries. And I do think that from a certain angle, they're almost opposites, right? AI presents an industry full of surplus and crypto represents an industry full of scarcity, right? And provenance using the blockchain. I, I'm excited to see how these two technologies interact. So that's my like broad thoughts on the industry. But for, for me in specific, in the poll, I guess we can call it, of AI, it, it hasn't extremely been there. The, the reason for this is, is essentially, I think that there are people in AI that are much smarter than me that are going to go and build awesome AI companies, right? And I don't think that I have any edge in AI. I think that I probably am at a, a lack of edge in AI um, versus in crypto. Crypto is something I understand. And if we understand both of these industries are going to be the two biggest industries over the next 30 years, um, I'd rather work in one where I can have a profound impact 
rather than one where I'm just like everybody else chasing the latest trend. Um, definitely want to veer away from away from that direction. That said, really excited about AI and specifically its collision with crypto. Gotcha. What advice would you give to a bear market survivor as being one yourself? I think for me, it's just like one word. I wrote a blog post about this actually. Um, and it's just perseverance, right? And it's pretty crazy, right? Like I think the last few years especially have been extremely crazy where you look around and people are making tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? The Joe Schmo on the street just raised a $50 million fund to go and do some crypto stuff. And he doesn't even know what an NFT is, right? Like this is the stuff that has occurred over the past couple of years and it's not the norm. And we're going to head into times that are not the norm, but on the other side of the spectrum in terms of tough time, right? Times when you have to hunker down. And my biggest piece of advice for people working through this is that it's going to get boring. So you need to find your people and find your mission, right? You need to find your group that's going to be able to push through this boredom with you. And that will only be possible if you guys find something amazing to work on. And something valuable to work on. Something valuable beyond just another NFT profile picture collection or something of the sort, right? I think that now is the opportunity to go and build these amazing things. And what gives me the most hope is all of the amazing stuff that we've seen over the past few years. A lot of it was built during the bear markets, right? Compound finance, Uniswap. A lot of this was born in a bear market. And I think that's pretty awesome. Right, and it's like I'm excited to see what what happens this bear market and what comes out of it. Can you uh, can you both crack a good joke just as a break? Oh, no. Your portfolio, Gajesh. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, USD, FTX claims. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why did the Bitcoin go to the to the launch pad to get to the moon? Oh my god, bro! Oh, I'm out of cool now. <laughs> yeah, I, I say the same joke fucking every time I have to say a joke. What building has the most stories? Trump Towers. A library. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> what are some productivity tips you'd like to share? I, I think I like briefly mentioned mine before, but I think like exercise, diet, sleep are pretty important. I think like especially cardio helps a lot with just like improving cognition and focus. I know I read like a whole bunch of research papers on this like a while back, which was like 120 to 150 minutes of like elevated heart, heart rate every week. So like I, I do a lot of like high intensity cardio every week uh, or try to do it every day, which I think helps a ton. Um, and I think past that, I don't know, my like to-do lists are pretty primitive, often just on paper, like checklists, right? Whatever. And I sometimes log my time, which helps like using a time tracker, like toggle, but not, not so much anymore. I think really for me, it just comes down to like focusing on the fundamentals because the uh, motivation and drive is already there. As long as I have the like biological capacity to work, I think I can work pretty hard. I, I think on my end, like I'm thinking of two separate types of things versus like aggressive software things that I do. So you have like the applications that I use. So like Cron, Spark, um, applications like this that just make my life, Arc is another one, um, that just make my life so much easier in terms of the applications that I use on a daily basis. So if I spend an hour on email and these applications make it 10% faster, then hell yeah, that's something that I will use. The The second is, is in terms of aggressive screen limits. Um, on Twitter, on, on everything, on basically anything that can be considered a distraction. Um, both of those I'd f fall under this idea of like technology, technology, um, things The the other thing that came to mind was basically just like, and Sukhan said this exercise, um, I, I personally do not drink coffee. I just go for runs instead of doing coffee. So I just like finished a four mile run right before this and literally just walked right into this meeting. Um, and that, I feel like that gave me more energy than a, a cup of coffee ever could. Sukons is going to start running too. I am. Yeah. It's been <laughs> mandated in the Wayman, Waymont Slack. Um, <laughs> we'll get to it soon. Yeah. <laughs>
Cool. Uh, what are some of the life lessons you would like to share? I don't know. A, a lot of the times I've like tried to fight against my own personal nature of like what I want to do. And I've come to realize that like sometimes I just need to allow myself to like be the person that I intrinsically am, which is like, I just really like like building stuff and doing things, right? I can't really sit still. Um, and oftentimes I would like stop myself from doing that, which would just like hurt and make me like, more like depressed almost right um and worried but i realized like okay sometimes you just gotta like let yourself do that and like sometimes it's like negative maybe ne negative like i'll do like an all-nighter right if i get really into a problem and get really excited but i feel like that's okay like motivation is fleeting and i like to seize it when i can um and then probably the other big lesson that i've been like really reflecting on and i talked about earlier is that like i kind of over sacrificed and over disconnected a lot over the past like couple of years or so so making a bit more time for family and life right while still working very hard i think is important in that like life is meant to be lived right and you can't just like completely sacrifice family friends relationships and you should make time for the people that matter in your life those are some good lessons i have like a i have a document that i keep on my computer that where it's basically like i should add lessons like life lessons that i've personally learned as i like go through life um in terms of personal ones that stick out as I'm just like skimming through this. Um, one is rely on a personal advisor board when you need to, right? Finding people who are just like understand you on all different dimensions and who you can go and seek their advice on things that are personal in nature, right? Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's other people, maybe it's just close friends. I think that like it's, it's super valuable to get external advice. Um, and opinions, whether you choose to go down it or not. One other one is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Get dopamine hits from the journey, not the end state. Um, and then the last one that I'll say, which is which is definitely one of my favorites. This is kind of business, kind of not business. Um, is don't fear competition. And don't worry about people watching. Like, people have their own things. People are worried about their own lives shouldn't care about what other people are going to think about anything, right? Naval always says, like, life is a single-player game. You should be optimizing for your own wins, right? And obviously, there are times when you can help others, not, not discounting that. But people get caught up on competition. People get caught up on this. People get caught up on how they're going to look. People get caught up on so many different things that at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is whether you won or not. I think a lot of people are like one of your points like a lot of people are afraid of like looking cringe right but it's like in reality no one really cares like no one's gonna think about you or what you did and it's like just do the thing you want to do exactly it's like it's crazy right people like it's 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 weird to conceptualize as like our own individual being that every other being in this universe has their own life right and their own worries and their own needs right and like yeah they're working eight hours a day maybe they're sleeping eight hours a day and what you do isn't going to take up more than an ounce of their brain right much less right you're you're literally like a like a two second not even two second point two seconds of their life on any random day that they won't even remember seven days later much less seven years later i think that people like definitely over optimize here in terms of like what people are going to think. And I think that it's like very much a personal and, and a business thing. Well, what are some of the alpha you'd like to share? No, you, you got to sign up to Waymon for that. That's, that's exclusive. It's membership it's... locked, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the alpha is, is, is Waymon. And I'll leave it that's at that. It. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, when Waymount retail? Uh, not not anytime soon. The better question is how do I become a whale and how do I get an invite? Yeah. How do I become a whale? <laughs> And yeah, also, I, I, I don't invite. think we have the time to cover that 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 lesson. So, for any ways listening to this podcast, follow Waymont and ask them for invite. But there is a link, right? Waymont.co. Cool. It has been an insightful one hour thirty minutes. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having That's us. Cool. This is a cool international call. We got LA, New Zealand, yes. and India. That's nice. India. Um, yeah. And thank you so much for having us. It's good to see you again, DJ.